All right. Well, we are in our study of Genesis. And last week, Robert did a great job looking at Genesis 3 and shame and why the world is now broken, why it's fallen, why everything is turned upside down from what God had intended it to be. And the reason why, in a word, is because of sin. Adam and Eve, God's image bearers, have rebelled against their creator. They broke the covenantal relationship with God by aligning themselves with the serpent. So instead of imaging forth, reflecting and displaying God, they're now imaging forth, reflecting and displaying the serpent. Those who are naked and unashamed now see who they are and what they have done. And they're afraid of being naked because they're filled with shame. So what do they do? They hide from God and they hide from each other. They try to cover up their guilt and shame with the things in creation, fig leaves to try to cover. And then ever since, all of us continue to hide, not only from God, but also from each other out of fear because of our sin. We're afraid of what God and what other people will see if they know what we've done. We fear being known. And we fear being rejected. So gone is the security of being vulnerable. Gone is the security of being open and completely honest with one another. Instead, in our fear and shame, what do we do? We hide, we wear masks, and pretend that we're doing better than we really are to cover up what we've done. Instead of revolving our life around and depending on God as the only source for life, we now devote ourselves to declaring our independence, <laughs> where we worship and serve created things rather than the creator. Instead of having dominion over all that God has made over creation, we are now subjected to and ruled by the things in creation. <laughs> Instead of depending on God's word as the basis for truth and ultimate reality, we now look to ourselves as the source to determine what is true. And what is most real to us, it's not what God says, it's what we see all around us. The joyous freedom of life under the rule of God as his image bearers has now been taken over by the terrifying tyrants of Satan, sin, death, and all of our fig leaf attempts to try to save ourselves and earn back God's favor. Amen. See, sin has wrecked our relationship with God, but it's also wrecked our relationships with each other. And it has wrecked our relationship with all of creation. And to see this, we must understand that sin is always relational. It's never just personal. It's always relational. Every time we sin, what do we do? We break relationship with God. We commit spiritual adultery against God. We belittle his glory and we shame him. And we treat him as if he's less than, as if he's not enough as if something else is greater and more satisfying than God. And when you see sin this way, when you realize that every time you sin, this is what you're doing, then isn't it any wonder that we fear that God will reject us? Because we reject and turn away from him, the hardest thing for us to believe and accept and wonder, will God now reject and turn away from me? Now, Genesis 3, it's not written to beat us down with how bad we are and how badly we mess things up. Although we're bad and we really mess things up. We're going to look at that. Um, but it's written to give us hope, actually. But for hope to shine we must be brought to despair, which means this is not an easy text to teach um, because it's here to show you and I that we are far worse than we think we are and that the consequences of our sin 
are far worse than we think they are. You see, man, we just we don't just do sinful things. We're in sin. We are under sin's power. We are enslaved and held captive to sin. And in verses 8 through 24, we're going to see the effects and the consequences of being in sin. But here's my point. Because we're in sin, because we're under its power, because we're under its influence, there's nothing you and I can do to change it. It is a stain that is so deep, there is no amount of effort on your part that can remove it. And sadly, some people, when they realize that the stain of their sin cannot be removed, they try to cover it up. <laughs> they do a little rearranging of the furniture in their life. Right? To hide the stain, they think, well, I'll just move something over it. And then that'll cover it. Nobody will be able to see it. Or what do we do? We just simply flip the cushion over, right? Oh, I'm going to turn things around in my life. I'm going to turn over a new leaf thinking that if I can just make a change, then it won't happen again. But what happens when you get a stain on the other side? Well, then there are some people who don't try to cover it up. They actually do try to remove it. They scrub, they scrub, they scrub, thinking that if I can just scrub hard enough, if I just put more effort into it, I can get rid of it. I'm going to get better. I'm going to work on this. And then sometimes it actually does look like you're making progress because, you know, the stain doesn't look as bad as it did. But what are you really doing? All you're doing is just pushing it around. You're just dispersing it. Your scrubbing cannot take it away. And then others, what do they do? They try to find a stronger cleanser <laughs> to get the stain out. But w which one? I mean, there are so many Christian infomercials out there saying, here's how to remove the stain. Just follow these instructions. Just do this and voila. Staying gone. All you need to do is just pray about it. Memorize scripture. Get into an accountability group. See yourself as a new person. And just stop doing it. Brothers, the stain of our sin is so bad that the only hope we have is for God to cleanse, to rescue and to deliver us from it. This is the point of what Genesis 3 wants us to see. So give your attention to the reading of God's word. I'm going to look at verses 8 because it's, there's some connections. Well, it's all connected, but we're going to start with verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And just so you understand, like, well, this translation misses it because doesn't it just sound like here's Adam and Eve skipping, hopping merrily in the garden in the cool of the day. No, when God comes to the cool of the day, it's the storm of the day. The whirlwind, which means God's coming in judgment. And the man and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Is it any wonder? <laughs> Uh, from among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, oh, the woman. <laughs> oh, but no, the woman who you gave me. She gave it to me and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman says, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity, which is hostility, conflict between you and the woman 
and between your offspring and her offspring. He, singular, somebody from the line of the woman is going to bruise your head and you shall strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. And then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove man out of the garden at the east of the Garden of Eden. He placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned in every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. This is the word of the Lord. All right, I'm going to pray real quick. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do need your spirit to open our eyes and illumine our minds to the reality of what this is teaching us. We do not have the wisdom on our own to understand you and your ways. And so we need your spirit to do this for us. And I pray that now you would be pleased to do that. And would you grant word and power, not just to your word, but would you grant the power and word for the one who's preaching it? And we ask of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. All of us have some sense of how selfish and sinful we are, right? We all know that we're imperfect because we're human after all, right? But if we're honest, none of us knows the full extent of it. Sure, as you get older <laughs> and the longer you live with yourself, uh, you get glimpses of just how broken and messed up you really are. But sadly, there are some of us who still cling to what one author called the Disney delusion, <laughs> where you still think you're a good person. Uh, you still think that but I can do whatever I set my mind to do. I can never do that. I can overcome anything. If this is you, you live in the delusion that you're not weak. If this is you, you live in the delusion that you're not needy, that you're not a dependent creature, that you're not full of sin. And if this is you, I will say this as gently as I can. And I had a seminary professor said, Pete, hey, whenever you step on somebody's toes, <laughs> just try not to scuff their shoes. <laughs> OK, so I'll say this as gently as I can. If this is you, you're living as if you don't need a savior. Which means you're not trusting in God's grace to save you. You're trusting in yourself which is how you image forth the serpent. Look at verse 8, because we need to see how serious our sin is. Right after Adam and Eve disobeyed God's command and they ate the forbidden fruit, did you notice how they heard? <laughs> they didn't see God coming. They heard the sound of God coming. And again, I told you why. Because it's the storm of the day. It's the whirlwind of the day. God's howling as he's coming towards his covenant breakers now. He's coming in judgment because what did he say? The day you eat of it, you will surely die. Gosh, is it any wonder Adam and Eve hide? <laughs> Catch this. God is coming in the storm cloud over one sin. <laughs> 
one act of disobedience, which shows us what every sin deserves the wrath and the curse of God. One little white lie to one act of murder. One prideful desire of thinking that I'm better than somebody else to actually abusing somebody in an attempt to prove that you are better. See, all sin, no matter how big or how small, in thought, in word, and in deed, deserves the wrath and the curse of God. Why? Because all sin is breaking relationship with God. All sin belittles God's glory. All sin shames God's character. And look at what we do whenever we know we have sinned against God. We don't just hide and try to cover up the stain of our sin. We, we shift the blame and say it's somebody else's fault. Verse 12, it's your fault, God, because the woman you gave me. She's the one who led me to do this. And then in verse 13, what does the woman do? She blames the serpent. Oh, he deceived me. It's his fault, not mine. See, we can try to shift the guilt and blame it on someone or something else. But the reality is this. We are responsible for our sin. This is why God's asking Adam and Eve, what have you done? Doesn't say, what did she do? What, did, what have you done? Did you disobey the command I gave you? See, God wants us to honestly face our sin. Not so that he can rub our noses in it. No, he wants us to face it so that we can see how only his grace can deal with it. Besides hiding from God out of fear, what do Adam and Eve try to do? They try, they attempt to cover their guilt and shame with something in creation. Fig leaves. Thinking that they can cover their guilt and shame. <laughs> this is our default mode now as human beings. Our default mode now is we trust in our works. We try to do something to fix our sin problem, believing that we can fix our sin problem. But our problem can't be fixed by anything we do, and we need to see how bad it really is. Our sin, it's so serious that its consequences affect and corrupt everything in creation. Look at verse 19, for you are dust and to dust you shall return, which means the history of mankind has been cursed and turned into a history of death, which was not God's original intent. Death is not a part of man's created nature. It's the wages of sin. Now, the consequences of man's sin, it brings about not only the curse of death, but also social discord. Look at how it affects women and their relationships in verse 16. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. So, yes, this does involve the physical pain of childbirth, but it involves so much more. It involves all the emotional pain of raising children. It involves all the emotional pain of loss. The pain of wayward children. The pain of barrenness. The pain of infertility. The pain of miscarriages. All pain and sorrow associated with having children. But it's not just moms. <laughs> Look at the second part of uh, verse 16. There's going to be conflict in marriages. Instead of submitting herself to the husband's headship, what's the woman going to try to do? She's going to try to rule the husband. And this word here for desire, it does not mean sexual desire, because in chapter 4, verse 7, the same word when God says to Cain, sin is crouching at your door, it desires you. In other words, it wants to rule over you. 
It wants to control you. But you must rule over it. Uh, and husbands, guess what? We're not off the hook. Instead of being the loving head who sacrifices for the good of his wife, what do we become? We become dictators uh, who try to dominate our wives. Or we passively allow the woman to lead and rule. But notice something, no matter what the husband does, whether he's a good head or a bad head, he's still the head. Which means even in his passivity, he's leading badly. Um, he's still the head. Why? Because he shall rule over you. This is how God arranged it. So instead of perfect unity in marriage is now, it's going to be characterized by discord, by disharmony, disunity. And then, man, there's also more. Look at verses 17 through 19. Instead of finding our identity in God and his love for us, we are now going to try to seek an identity in what we do. But what we do is cursed. <laughs> so now it's going to frustrate us. It's now going to beat us up. Our labor, it's now going to become wearisome. It's going to become a burden. It's going to become a disappointment. Instead of fruit, the cursed ground is going to produce what? Thorns and thistles. So instead of ruling over creation, we are now afflicted and ruled by creation. So to sum it up, this common curse is what? It's God subjecting the world to corruption. Which means now human existence is turned into a struggle for survival. In a wilderness with little resources. There's a perpetual conflict with nature. There's pain and sorrow in all of our relationships, but it gets even worse. Because in verses 22 through 24, man lost God's favor. To dramatically portray the loss of God's favor upon man, what are we told? He's driven out of the garden. He's driven out of God's presence. The intimate fellowship that man once shared with his creator, it's now gone. The ones who were to guard and keep the garden are now guarded and kept from the garden where there's a cherubim with a flashing sword barring the way back in. Sin has wrecked and ruined our relationship to God. Sin wrecks and ruins our relationship with others and with all of creation causing separation, discord, conflict, power struggles. All of creation is corrupted and affected by our sin. We've been kicked out of the garden, out of God's presence, and we've lost his favor. So can you see why it's easy to lose hope when we live in this kind of world? But doesn't hope shine in desperation? See, our passage, in other words, it's meant to show us just how bad it really is. Why? So we would stop looking to ourselves. So we would stop looking to the things in creation to give us and to do for us what they can't. In other words, we can't fix ourselves or change our condition in sin. Which means you only have one hope to fall back on. The mercy and the grace of God. See, do you realize that every step that God takes in the garden are steps of grace? In verse 8, when God comes in judgment, what should it have led to? Ultimate, final condemnation. But it doesn't. God subjects the world to corruption, 
instead of ultimate and final condemnation. Which means what? God is expressing his desire and his delight to be gracious and merciful. See, the postponement of final and ultimate judgment has done what? It's opened the door wide open for reconciliation and redemption now. Now, in other words, the main intent of our passage is to give us hope that amidst all of the consequences and all of the corruption of what our sin caused, there is conquest. Look at God's judgment upon the serpent and his promise of a redeeming champion in verses 14 through 15. Because you have done this, curse are you. The serpent is the only one who's directly cursed. The woman and the man are not cursed. Childbirth, pain, and the ground are cursed, not Adam and Eve. The serpent is the only one who's directly cursed. Cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, and then he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise or strike his heel. Only the serpent is directly cursed. But notice, he's, this isn't immediately executed, though. His doom is assured. But from now on, in humiliation and defeat, he's going to be in a prostrated position before God always. And then notice, it's God's power that is going to break this unholy alliance between the woman and the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman. I'm going to break this relationship you have created. I'm going to restore my relationship with you. See, verse 15 is one of those verses, holy cow, it's so packed with meaning that it literally takes the rest of the Bible to disclose all that's in this one verse. See, theologians call this the proto-evangelion, the first announcement of the gospel where God is promising a redeemer who's going to come from the line of the woman. And this redeemer is going to do what Adam failed to do. He's going to judge the serpent as evil and crush his head. He is going to render the serpent powerless. He is going to reverse the consequences of the fall. He is going to restore God's kingdom that got turned upside down. Notice, God's the one who's going to cause it. God's going to overturn it. God is going to reconcile the relationship with man. God's going to break this alliance by a single seed of the woman who's going to crush the head of the serpent. But you can't miss this. There's only two seeds. There's only two families. There's only two lines. You have the seed of the woman... And you have the seed of the serpent, which means there's only the righteous or the unrighteous. There's only the saved and the unsaved. There's only those who have been adopted into God's family by grace. And then there are those who imitate their father, the serpent, and seek to do his will. The curse, in other words, pronounced to the serpent, it's a declaration of holy war where there are only two sides. Those who trust in God's grace to save them or those who image forth the serpent and try to save themselves. This war begins with the woman and the serpent and continues unrelenting throughout all of history until the single seed arrives. The particular seed of the woman who's going to crush the head of the serpent. Now, we don't have time to trace this out and follow the path of the woman's seed. But in Matthew's genealogy, don't we know that it goes from the woman to Noah, from Noah to Abraham, from Abraham to David, and from David 
to Jesus. Gosh, you, this is why genealogies are so important in the Old Testament. Because every genealogy is saying God is faithful to fulfill his promise of sending the Messiah. And as the line continues, it's proving God's faithfulness. Which means what? In spite of our sin, the family line continues until it finds its fulfillment in Jesus. And I have to end, but I want you to notice three things. I want you to notice from Genesis 3, verse 8 on, it's all grace. But especially look at verse 24. I want you to see the grace of this. By not allowing Adam to eat of the tree of life. What's God doing? He doesn't want Adam to remain in his corrupted condition forever. See, if Adam would have eaten of the tree of life, he would have remained in his corrupted condition forever. So God bars him, which opens the door for redemption. Second, if God subjected the world to corruption and not ultimate condemnation, then how in the world can we ever enter back into God's presence? How can we ever enter into day seven, God's eternal Sabbath rest and delight? How can we regain God's favor? The only way back in is through the flaming sword. And I'm going to look at that in a moment. But before, I want you to look at verses 20 through 21 so that we can see how we enter God's rest and regain his favor and delight. Why does Adam name his wife Eve? Because she's the mother of what? The living, not the dead. <laughs> so, what's going on here? Doesn't this show us that Adam believes the promise that God made in verse 15? That Adam believes she's going to Give birth to the Messiah. <laughs> that God would graciously provide a redeemer who would come from Eve. Which means, in other words, Adam is trusting God amidst the curse of corruption. He's trusting that God's going to provide the conquering champion. Who would do what he failed to do so that Adam could live. And then what happens in verse 21? After Adam believed in God's gracious promise of a redeemer, what does God do? He then covers Adam and Eve with garments of skin. <laughs> Where'd God get the skin? From an animal. Well, what had to happen to that animal? It had to die. Its blood was shed, and then God takes the skin of that sacrificed animal, and he clothes Adam and Eve with it. Man, <laughs> what a picture. Do you see the picture? Do you see how there is only one way to regain God's favor and enter back into his presence? That one way means someone has to go through the flaming sword of God's judgment. See, Jesus is the promised champion who would come from the line of the woman who's going to crush the head of the serpent. Jesus is the one who willingly goes through the flaming sword of God's judgment. Jesus was cut in two. So we could be justified and enter back in. See, when we trust in God's gracious promise of a redeemer, when we see and believe that Jesus took our place, that Jesus paid the penalty for our sin against God, and then he sheds his blood 
God then takes his perfect sinless life. He takes his robe of righteousness and he covers and clothes you with it. So now you have his delight. You have his favor. (sighs) Which means only Jesus' righteousness is sufficient to cover our guilt and shame. And do you remember what God cursed in verses 17 to 18? Because of Adam's sin, what did he curse? He cursed the ground. And what did he say it would produce? Thorns. What was Jesus wearing as he hung naked on the cross, bearing and becoming our shame? A crown of thorns. Which means this crown is the crown of Jesus' glory. Why? Because Jesus is crowned with our curse. Brothers and sisters, if you're watching and listening, our condition is so bad that it takes the death of God's own son to rescue us from it. So I have one exhortation and that's it. Come out from behind the trees. Stop hiding from God. Take off your fig leaf's attempt to try to cover your guilt and shame and trust in the only sufficient covering. Trust in Jesus and his sacrifice to cover you because it is only Jesus' righteousness that's a sufficient covering for your guilt and shame. Let me pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we live in a world that is turned upside down. We live in a world that you have subjected to corruption, not ultimate condemnation. And because you have subjected it to corruption and have not condemned it, You've opened the door wide for redemption. You've opened the door wide for reconciliation. But this text shows us the only way that happens is through the seed of the woman that you promised to give. The one who would crush the head of the serpent because he passes through the flaming sword of your justice. He takes our place. He becomes our sin, our shame, and he pays the penalty for all of it. So now there is no wrath left for those who trust in him. So now would you increase our faith in him? Would you increase our assurance that his righteousness is the only sufficient covering for our guilt and shame, and that because he was perfect for us, you now view and treat us as if we're perfect. Thank you for this incredible gift of your grace, because no one here deserves it. We only deserve your wrath and curse, but instead you give us your son. And we ask that you would open our eyes more and more to what he's done for us. And we ask that you would be pleased to do it because we need you to do it in Jesus' name. Amen.